Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Neuroscience Talk Series at ISG Austria. It is my great pleasure to introduce our external guest for today, Professor Tom Barden. Tom got his PhD in 2008 from the University of Cambridge and then followed with postdocs in the lab of Professor Leon Lagnado and Professor Thomas Euler. In 2016, he joined the University of Sussex, where he is now a professor of neuroscience studying the retinal basis of vision. His work has greatly contributed to our understanding of the vertebrate retina, including the discovery of spiking in retinal bipolar cells, cataloging the functional repertoire of retinal ganglion cells, and mapping the distribution of cones across retinal space. Apart from his own personal contributions to science, Tom co-founded the nonprofit organization Trend in Africa that works on building scientific capacity across Africa through trainings, equipment donations, and the use of open hardware. Their training courses now have more than 500 alumni in at least 20 different African countries who go on to influence local research, science education, and policy making at a local and global level. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Tom has received multiple awards for his work, including the Nature Global Impact Award, the Lister Prize for Preventive Medicine, and the Flip Philip Leverhulme Prize, among others. Today, he will be talking about cones with characters and in vivo circuit implementation of efficient coding. Tom, excited to hear your talk. Well, thank you, uh, Devyansh, for this wonderful introduction and for inviting me. All right, let's see if I can manage to share this screen. Um, let's go here. And just to check that you can see the screen like this. Yep. All right. Okay, well, thank you all. Um, thank you again for the, for the invite and thank you all for joining. Um, so we in the lab, we are generally interested, well, we're interested in a lot of things, but one of the core interests that really binds pretty much everything is uh, we want to understand how neurons compute. And this is, this is both at the single cell level and at the, at the microcircuit level and also at the macrocircuit level. And um, of course, there's lots of parts of the nervous system that one could use as a model uh, to do so. What we do in the lab mainly is we look at the vertebrate retina um, because it is very neatly organized into repeating circuits. So that, that really does reduce the dimensionality of the problem a lot. Um, and of course, it's a layered structure with a very clear input and a very clear output uh, definition. So it's, it's um, from a computation point of view, it's a, it's a very neat system to work with. But then at the same time, it is sufficiently complex to, to be interesting or, or possibly even overwhelming at times. So um, when we look at retinal complexity, and this is now just a, a, a chart that I pulled from a recent review that we've published, um, looking across species, what the retina is up to in, in all these different species. And basically what you can see here is we've plotted the number of retinal ganglion cells, so the output channels per eye um, in a given species as a function of how big the eye is. So this is the retinal area. Um, so if all eyes had similar density of these ganglion cells, then you would expect all the dots to fall on one of those isodensity lines. And as you can see, clearly they do not. Um, you get pretty, pretty big variation in the order of something like two orders of magnitude. Um, so for example, one that I'd like to point out is if you look at the mouse here and compare that to the hummingbird, they sort of have approximately similar eye size, ever so slightly bigger here. Um, but the number of ganglion cells in the hummingbird is more than an order of magnitude higher than in the mouse. Um, and then at the same time, we can compare the hummingbird with the human. And then here you've got approximately similar number of ganglion cells, but then the human eye is of course much, much bigger. Um, which of course begs us to wonder, right? Is the hummingbird just a tenfold more dense version of a mouse or human retina? Or does it perhaps have tenfold more diverse neuron types or something in between of those two? And, and right now we don't really have an answer to this. And of course, working on a hummingbird is quite difficult, but we do have the zebrafish, which is a sort of nice compromise there um, because it is denser than the mouse. Um, and, uh, and the zebrafish larva is incredibly dense, but it's also really small, so it's a funny outlier. So, but when we um, reorganize this graph a little bit, I, one thing that I always thought was striking is that um, the, the only difference here so is that we now plot the mean density um, against peak density. So basically, this is the interesting axis in this case. So if your retina is dense, it'll be over here. And if it's not so dense, it's over here. 
And what you can do is you can draw a histogram of these example species that we've got. And basically, if you bunch together the mammals, uh, including us, uh, with the sharks and the jawless fish, um, then you get a little hump here. And then if you take everybody else, you get another hump higher. So it seems that there seems, it, it, it almost suggests that there's different density regimes that different groups of animals uh, work in. And the problem is that the vast majority of what we know about retinas comes from this hump um, rather than this hump. So, and as it so happens, the fish are in this, in this area. So I think looking at fish in order to understand retinal computation is, is powerful, not just to understand what the fish is up to, but perhaps also to understand how a high density retina can operate and, and what are the sort of computations that it implements. So, um, Another point um, why the fish is particularly nice, um, or, or why the fish is representative, let's say, uh, of, of many vertebrates, is if you look at the photoreceptor complement, right? So if you look evolutionarily very old, so the, the oldest things that diverge in the vertebrate lineage are jawless fish, things like lampreys and hackfish. Lampreys are the interesting ones here, and they are actually quite diverse in terms of their photoreceptor complement. And even though it has changed, of course, as different lineages emerged, um, overall, we have quite a lot of different photoreceptor types in most of these lineages, with the exceptions of the mammals. The mammals are the ones that lost a couple of those, um, uh, essentially during the age of the dinosaurs here, um, and where well, they never got them back. The only, the only ones really that got them back is the old world primate by duplicating the green one into a red one, uh, which generates a whole host of new problems that I, I, I will not be going into here today. But basically, that means that for the vast majority of retinal circuits that have been mapped in terms of color, which come from mammals, um, we have a two-dimensional problem if we ignore the rods for now. Whereas in most of these species, we have a four or sometimes even five-dimensional problem. So what's, what's the point of having all these extra rods, uh, extra cones uh, in basically most vertebrates? That's sort of something that's really intrigued me. Um, and, and we've sort of centered much of the work in the lab around it. So we will specifically in this talk talk about the baby zebra fish. Um, notice that the eye is so small that the curvature is, is obvious pretty much anywhere you look. Um, but it still has those four cone types, and it pretty much has more or less the complement of retinal neurons that you would find in the adult. Um, certainly has the same classes of neurons. So uh, in this first bit of the talk, what I will be doing is I will be asking a very simple question is, what, what's the circuit in the outer retina do for color processing? So you've got four different cone types, so it's a tetrachromat. Um, and we actually have what we think is three horizontal set types, which are connected in interesting ways to these cones. And that forms a seven element circuit that solves presumably some sort of spectral processing function as well as some other functions. And we wanted to understand, okay, what, what is the spectral processing that happens here? Now, um, and the hope is that um, one, is that we can solve the circuit functionally and anatomically. And then two is that we can then relate it to the natural visual world of zebrafish. So this is just an example video that we took in the field. Um, stu a previous student, Nora Nevala, who's, who's now a postdoc uh, elsewhere, uh, took this video um, in, in India, where we basically, we filmed zebrafish uh, with a variety of techniques. And so we've got natural imaging data, which we can then relate to this now. Um, so the first thing that we need to do in order to uh, understand spectral processing is build a stimulation device that's capable of oversampling the photoreceptor array. So what you can see here, this is the photoreceptors as defined by the opsins in the zebrafish. You can see the opsins are pretty broad. Um, and this is what our stimulator achieves. You can see we've got more narrow spectra than the opsins. So using this um, battery of uh, light flashes that we can deliver, we can oversample this array and therefore get tuning functions uh, in the visible range for the zebrafish. The way this is achieved, and this is, this is work by Philip, um, who took a paper by Belusic et al and modified um, what, they, what they came up with. He basically put a bunch of LEDs on these rails at different angles across a diffraction grating. And then some of the light from each LED bounces into the diffraction grating and off again in such a way that it hits a collimator. And that serves A to, to put a lot of LEDs into the same point in space, uh, ultimately at the fish eye, but it also serves to make the LED spectrum, which is actually quite broad usually, more narrow because some of the LED light will miss the collimator. So with this device, um, we synchronize it with the two photon um, so that we don't uh, see the stimulus during the scan. Um, and then we presented the fish as a whole field flash of light. And I just want to point out, so all the data that we'll be showing today is full field flashes of light. We do not look at spatial processing at this time. 
now. Um, so to, to then uh, see what we can do with the stimulus, um, Takeshi uh, generated a bunch of G-camp lines. And this is the first one that I show here. So this is a red cone G-camp line. So only the red cones are expressing this calcium indicator. And what we're looking here is the individual synaptic terminals of cones. So this is one cone, this is the next cone, this is the next cone, and so on. And we know they're red because it's genetically fine. This is all in vivo. Um, and then what Takeshi does is he basically presents flashes of light at these different wavelengths, starting from deep red, going to deep UV. And then we're getting a response from a single cone and you can see there's a certain tuning functions associated with this. Now from here, what we can do is we then flip it twice, which is quite confusing. So bear with me here. So we flip it in X because we were silly enough to start with red, but conventional is to start with UV in these wavelengths plots. Um, and then we flip it in Y because the cones are hyperpolarizing neurons, but it's easier to read the tuning functions if it's above uh, zero. So all of these tuning functions that I will show now are double flipped and hopefully that'll be understandable. Okay, so this is the red cone. Um, then Takeshi generated g lines for the other cones as well, repeated this experiment. So here's a green cone, here's a blue cone, here's a UV cone and get the tuning functions. Um, and even though these are single cell examples, this already kind of tells you what's going on. So you've got a broadband cone, one that doesn't really cross zero. So this is a non-opponent cone. Then you've got one that has a strong opponent response another one, another strong opponent response with a different zero crossing, not the differences here. And then the, the UV one is essentially non-opponent again, right? So we've got two opponent channels and two non-opponent channels with specific wavelength tunings. These channels are very stable, um, both across fish, across repeats and across regions of the eye. So this is dorsal nasal S for strike zones, so this is the acute zone of the fish, a bit like, like a pre-fovea. Uh, and this is ventral. And you can see, even though there's some small differences between regions, the bulk of them basically do the same. It responds quite well here and a bit less well here. And you get these broad tuning functions, which never cross zero. Then in green, you get um, an opponent response here. And, an, uh, and this is the, no, actually, this is the, this is the uh, inherent response and this is the opponent response. And then here you get a blue response, which is opponent here. And then you get a UV response, which is a little bit opponent in the greens, but it's basically just a UV filter. Now, um, this being uh, possibly interesting, now the next question is, okay, what's the point of this? Why, why would you generate your tuning functions like this? And one answer we think comes from, uh, oh, before I jump into that, and I just want to point out that um, what you see here in the thick lines, uh, these are log compressed uh, or log, log transformed opsin fits. And basically the point here is that this is the prediction of what the cone should be doing if it's only being fed by its opsin and there's no circuit computation going on. And what you can see is that the red, it sort of fits, it's not perfect here, but it's not a terrible fit. The green doesn't fit at all. The blue doesn't fit at all. And by definition, these two can't fit because the, the opsin cannot predict opponency. Um, and the UV is sort of fits again. Now, so what's the point of these curves? Ah, I've reorganized the talk and, uh, okay, different direction, I'll get back to this point. Okay, so what's happening here is we were wondering what's the circuit that generates this, not what's the point of it. So the circuit that generates it, uh, the obvious question is, is it horizontal cells? So the horizontal cells are the only inhibitory neurons uh, in the outer retina uh, and they connect between the cones. So um, chances are, if you get rid of them, then you can turn off all the opponency in the cones. And it turns out that's true. So when we pharmacologically block them, and this is now the data that you get, um, you can see now it fits really quite nicely. So the, um, the dotted line is the in vivo before the drug, and then after the drug is the solid lines. And you can see now the opsin predicts the solid line very nicely in all four cases. So that kind of very strongly implies that the only thing that tunes these cones is the horizontal cells. Um, as opposed to things like gap junctions. Right. So next we wanted to see, so what's the actual circuit? So to some extent, the horizontal cell cone circuit in the zebrafish is understood based on work in adults. But of course, this is a larva, so we can't just uh, take the adult, adult numbers and, and translate them. So what Takeshi did here is he, he uh, EM reconstructed the entire um, outer retina in a patch, uh, which, is, which is sort of aligned with the acute zone of the fish for a bunch of cones. So all of these cones are reconstructed and then all of these horizontal cells that are beneath are reconstructed. Here you see just the horizontal cells. And they're already color coded based on the type that we associate with them, one, two, and three. 
Um, I won't go into the details of how we decided there's three of them, but we're fairly sure the statistics work out quite well in this. Um, and here's the big punchline of all of this. Um, here's an H1, H2, and H3 example. And here is the cones that we get under EM. So H1 connects to all of the cones, but it does avoid the UV if it can. Um, H2 never connects to red, but it connects quite happily to the other three. And H3 never connects to red or green, but it connects very happily to UV and sometimes it catches the odd blue cone. But the number of blue cones is, is quite small compared to UV cones. So this is almost like a UV private channel horizontal cell. This one connects them all and this is some point intermediate between them. Now, um, based on the circuit, we're wondering, okay, so we've got the cones and we know there's three horizontal cells that connect in a certain way. Can we uh, take the physiological measurements with and without horizontal cell blockage, which are shown here. So horizontal cells blocked is in solid lines, horizontal cells not blocked is in, uh, in, in these sort of shady lines. Um, um, and can we then computationally add um, these horizontal cells in order to go from the solid lines to the shady lines? And this is something that Cornelius Schröder did here, um, uh, who's a PhD student in the lab of Philipp Behrens in Tübingen. So what Cornelius did, the first thing is he put, a, he put together a linear model, um, putting all three horizontal cells um, in, and then this is what the model produces. And as you can see, the fit is really quite good. So the green is almost essential, almost perfectly explained. The blue is sort of missing, but it's definitely going in the right direction. The red is only overshooting a bit. And then the UV again is very well explained. Um, so this is when you put all three horizontal cells in. Um, what we can then get from this is we can get a weight matrix. So for example, horizontal cell one is pulling a lot of weight, horizontal cell two and three is not pulling so much weight. Uh, and then within horizontal cell one, we can, for example, see that green is very important, UV is not so important, and red and blue are sort of in, in intermediate. And actually, um, I'm not showing this here, but Cornelius has also run the model using just H1, just H2, just H3, or all combinations thereof. And the punchline is H1 is always the strongest one. If H1 is present, the model is good. If H1 is missing, the model is bad. Uh, and we take that to mean that essentially H1 is the color cell, whereas H2 and H3 do something else. They, they help with the color processing, but they're not the main thing that, 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 that is required. Uh, so you can get almost the same performance using just H1. Another thing that the model then generates is um, not just the weights, but also a tuning prediction of how the horizontal cells should be spectrally tuned, just like the cones. And it predicts that H1 should be broadband, H2 should be, um, it doesn't actually get quite to zero, but it's sort of, uh, well, it's quite different and it's, it's certainly short wavelength bias. And then H3 is this, this triphasic, which is sort of positive, negative, positive. Okay, so then we wanted to verify the model experimentally. And the way that we did this is we went back to uh, physiological recordings. Uh, and this is actually now voltage imaging. So Takeshi um, expressed this voltage indicator ASAP3, which is one of the few ones that actually work under two photon. Um, most of them don't really work so well. And he expressed it under Connexin 55.5, which is a horizontal cell uh, promoter. And you can see it very nicely labels horizontal cells. And then you can put yourself some ROIs over the cell bodies and you can get some tuning functions. Um, in this case, we've reduced the stimulus space a bit to save some time. Um, so this is just three examples, one, two, three here. And then Takeshi did this a bunch of times and we clustered the results. Um, and this is what it spits out. You basically, you get one, which is incredibly broadband. Then you get one that's a bit more sparse, which is very short wavelength dominated. And then you get one that's even more short wavelength dominated with some sort of weak um, opponency here. Here's the tuning function for these guys. So here's the, the average from this cluster and the tuning functions. And what is really quite nice, I thought, is when you superimpose your tuning function, which is now the, the shady line with the model, which is a solid line, they're pretty similar. And that really, to me, suggests that the circuit is essentially as predicted from the linear model. So that these tuning functions of horizontal cells can generate out of the ops in tuning functions, these in vivo tuning functions in the cones. And that basically means that this seven element circuit for wavelength processing is essentially solved in this way. It's quite a simple circuit. It's, it, it can be explained in a linear fashion. Um, 
And it seems that to go from, from an opsin to, a, to, to this sort of complex opponent thing is being done by three horizontal cells and really mainly by just the one. That's what the model said anyway. So now finally, you've been waiting for the bit when, when I tell you what the point is. So this now goes back to using the natural imaging data. So instead of just using a camera, uh, which has three color channels, which are just for humans, so they're not very useful for zebrafish in for, for all questions. Um, we also built this thing here, which is what we call a hyperspectral scanner. It's basically a spectrometer with a bunch of mirrors, um, which we can then move about in order to generate hyperspectral scans. So here's, here's uh, an example of what this does. Um, so here's, uh, this is our department, isn't it lovely? Um, so here's a blue door and the red, red wall. And so we're scanning the 60 degree window here with this thing, and then we false color code our result. So here now each pixel is a full spectrum. So the blue pixel here, for example, is this spectrum and the red pixel here is the spectrum. So this is a full hyperspectral image. And of course, we can use the same thing to throw it in the water uh, where the zebrafish actually live. Um, this is a schematic of the scanner, if, uh, just to give you an idea, and then get lots of spectra. And in this case, what we've done here now is we've just taken lots of scenes, got lots of spectra, so a thousand pixels per uh, scene, 30 scenes gives us 30,000 spectra. And then we just that normalize them and showing here the mean and the standard deviation. And this is done by Philip uh, Bartle now, so a PhD student in the lab. Um, and then what Philip asked is, okay, given that we have these lovely spectra from these scenes, what can we, can, can we compare what these spectra do uh, relative to the opsins or relative to something else? So what he's done here now is he's basically taken this particular scene, the reason we use this one because it's got this white rock so you can kind of see that it actually works. So this is a reconstruction of the scene with the hyperspectral data if you use the red opsin. So we take this red opsin curve, we take all the spectra from this image, we convolve them, we get a number per pixel and that's the grayscale uh, picture that you get here. Um, and you can see you get a picture with a rack with a rock and a bit of water in the background and some foreground uh, action. And then Philip does the same with the green and you get this image with the blue and with the UV and you get these four images. And the, the, the interesting thing about this um, is that it's not very interesting. Um, so if you look, if you compare the red and the green and the blue, they're basically identical as you can see in the, in the correlation matrix here as well. The UV is a little bit different, but you know, ever so slightly different, I would say. So the correlation is a bit lower, but basically this is a terrible sampling strategy for the natural spectra from the scene, because basically the four cones would tell you four times the same thing. Um, and that's of course redundant. Now, if you look at what the options, uh, what the cones are actually doing in the full circuit, including the opponency, uh, Philip just basically did the same strategy um, and again, take the red, green, blue UV and convolved it with these curves. And now you're getting four more or less different images. And that really is the punchline here, that this very clearly decorrelates this representation of, of, of the spectral space. Um, now, but the question now becomes, so how good is this decorrelation? How much better can you go in theory? So one way of asking this question is you can, you can just go completely ignore the options or the, the tuning functions and just go into the data here and do a principal component analysis across the data and basically just pull the principal components, the first three anyway, that, that emerge um and see what they look like and they look like this so the first component here in black the second component here in, in gray and then the third in, in sort of lighter gray and then you can take these components and again convolve them with the spectra that's specific for the scene and you generate these images so this is what principal components would do the best possible way to explain the variance uh in a, in the small number of uh in the smallest number of components and what is really quite striking is that pc1 does look like uh, the red cone, PC2 does look like the green cone, and PC3 is sort of reminiscent of some sort of mix of these guys here. Um, and just to show you how good that matches, so here's the red cone superimposed on the first principal component. Uh, the green cone on the second, I think that match really is quite striking, including the zero crossing, which is really the, where, where the magic happens with these, with these opponencies. And then blue and UV together somehow follow the third one, right? So you can see the, the UV one follows the short wavelength leg and the blue one sort of better on the long wavelength leg. And in fact, if you add up blue and green, then you get something that looks kind of reasonable, if not perfect, um, at least good enough to more or less capture the shape. So it really kind of suggests 
that what the zebrafish is really doing is it's sending this kind of representation to, to the brain or, or to the rest of the retina in this case, these are cones after all. All right, so you've got a grayscale image, which basically just takes the, the brightness across the scene. Um, you've got a second grayscale image, which takes the brightness across the scene with a little bit of UV so, uh, green subtraction, but in a sort of UV overexposed manner. So you're basically highlighting UV features. Um, so this is a second grayscale channel. And then you get yourself two color channels, which are somehow near optimal for what, for what light is there in the world, right? So basically you get yourself a grayscale channel, color channel, another color channel, and then a second sort of a fancy UV overexposed gray, grayscale channel. So um, if we just look at these two, um, so how, how good is this difference? How, how useful is it? Well, one thing that comes to mind um, is if we think about uh, prey capture in these, these larva zebrafish. So this is something that a lot of people have uh, looked at quite carefully, the prey capture. And what's nice about it is that um, these paramecia, which these zebrafish eat, uh, they're quite difficult to see when you look at them with a yellow filter. So basically the sort of filter that more or less would mimic this. You can see them if you try really hard, um, but basically you get the background, you get the, the water reflection, you get the foreground and all of this kind of overwhelms the visual system. It makes it really hard to pick out these little, uh, little elements floating about. Whereas in the UV, that's completely gone. The UV is not very good at all of giving you scene information, right? So you, you can barely see the foreground. You can see a completely overexposed sky. And then there's this sort of window in between uh, where you can see these paramecia floating about as white dots, right? So just using a UV filter basically does half the job of prey detection for the, for the zebrafish. Um, so this is actually something we've published recently. Um, if, you, if you want to know more about it, I just want to show you one nice thing about it. So this is behavioral experiment done by Nora. And this is a very simple experiment. We just put a fish in a dish and we're counting um, how often it goes for the prey in a head mounted situation. And every time you've got a little dot here, that means it's trying. Um, and then the color that's here in the background is just the illumination of the, of the whole chamber. So we put UV lights on and then we switch the UV lights on and put uh, yellow ones on and so on. We just keep going back and forth. And as you can sort of very easily eyeball, uh, the zebrafish greatly prefers going for the prey in the UV phases as opposed to the yellow phases. If you align them, it becomes pretty obvious. So very strongly suggests that the zebrafish is using this effect in order to see its prey. And yes, it can see it in this, it's just really hard to do. Um, so it doesn't, doesn't try very often, especially if UV comes along every now and then. Um, and then if you genetically ablate the UV cones, that effect goes away entirely. So it's not just that they're using the fact that you can see them in the UV, maybe with the blue cones or something, it is the UV cones that are driving this behavior. If you take them out, it's gone. Um, so this very strongly suggests that the second achromatic channel is at least partly uh, underlying prey capture. Um, all right. So having seen all this, um, it kind of suggests that the cones are really quite clever, right? So you've got yourself a grayscale scale channels, you've got two color channels, and then you've got a prey capture channel. So what's, what's the point of any of the rest of the visual system for color processing? Presumably it's just, you, you might think it's solved. Um, but of course, you still have to push the signal into the brain, and there's lots of nuances that you have to consider in, in the spectral processing. And also, you've got the problem that even though maybe the spectral processing is already pretty optimal, you still have to process all this other stuff like shapes and edges and motion and things like that. And of course, that will that'll interfere with the, with the already clean color channels, in possibly. So um, in order to look at how how or what, what the rest of the, the, the visual system does, we next looked at the bipolar cells. So the bipolar cells are the neurons that pick up the signal from the outer retina and send it to the inner retina. Uh, and there's lots of them in the order of 20 uh, plus in the, in the zebrafish, and this is now in the adult zebrafish. So you've got yourself here this, uh, the four cones, and then here this is sort of my connectivity matrix for your, for your 20 bipolar cell types. So in adults, uh, people have looked at this quite nicely. So there's this paper from the Dowling lab some while ago, for example, where you can uh, look at individual dendrites and bipolar cells. You can stain the, um, the cone terminals, which form a mosaic in the adult, which is convenient. And then you can work out this bipolar cell content contacts this cone, but it doesn't contact uh, some other cone. And based on that, you can basically work out what is the sort of connections that these bipolar cells do uh, make in the adult. 
if you look at that paper and you sort of eyeball it, this is basically the picture that you get. You get a decent number of bipolar cells that uh, pretty much grab anything they can. I should point out, this is the rods here, the, the fifth one. Uh, the baby zebrafish don't have functional rods yet, so they're not really relevant for us now, but just they're just here for completeness sake. So anyway, so you've got a, a good number of bipolar cells that grab all of the cones. Then you've got a handful that grab all except from UV. Then you've got a quite a good number that grab green and blue, uh, green, green and red, but not not the short wavelengths ones. And then you've got a very small number that do something sort of a bit more refined. So the only ones that sort of oops um, grab uh, grab UV and blue without grabbing uh, red. There's only two of them. Then there's one. There's a couple of private line green channels and there's one private line red channel which also grabs the rod. This would be sort of the fish rod bipolar cell circuit, presumably mixed bipolar cell. Um, so, um, this is very confusing, you might think, right? So you've got these really clean cone signals and then all of the bipolar cells just mess it up by pooling them. What's that about? Um, so, in order to understand this, we then went on to measure what the bipolar cells in the lava actually uh, what the bipolar cells actually do in the lava um, in vivo with the same stimulus protocol. So this is this is a video Takeshi made, and this is the entire IPL in a single plane across the eye. So this is the bit of the eye that looks down, the bit that looks up, that looks outwards, and this looks sort of forwards. Uh, acute zone is here, so this is this is what we previously called the strike zone. And each of these little blobs that you can sort of see um, is a single synapse. You can see the on and off layers oscillating. Um, especially here, it's quite clear. As you flash on and on, on and off the light at different wavelengths, let me just play that once more. So um, just because it's quite pretty. So the, the information richness that is in there is really quite quite overwhelming. So of course, just looking at this video isn't, isn't really gonna give an impression of, of what's really going on. So we extracted a large number of terminals from a large number of fish. And this is now work that Philip has done again. Um, and clustered them. And so here's a bunch of clusters that Philip came up with. In this case, it's something like 36. Um, and um, they are ordered in this case by IPL depth. So these are the off most stratifying and these are the on most stratifying bipolar cells. And here's the cluster mean. Um, and this is completely overwhelming, I realize, uh, which is why I've pulled out a few just as examples to give an impression of the sort of tuning functions that these um, bipolar cells pull out. So you get a very small number of bipolar cell that look a little bit like an opsin. So this looks a bit like the, the red opsin here. And this guy looks a little bit like the UV opsin, even though there's some fairly strong opponents here already. Um, so these are kind of looking like copies of cones-ish, um, even though they're not perfect copies. Um, but they're not, they're not a majority of clusters. Then you've got quite a lot of clusters that are very broad, much broader than the, than the red. Um, which is actually quite good because if you if you remember from the natural imaging data, the red was a good approximation of PC1, but it wasn't perfect. It wasn't quite as broad as PC1. So these broad ones are actually a bit closer. So that may be a little trick there. Um, there's quite a few of these, but then it gets complicated. You get some that have two peaks, but they don't go opponent. So that, I don't know what that's about. And then you start having a mixture of kinetics and, uh, and wavelength tuning. So for example, you've got this transient component that pops in is even a transient off component here, but that transient off seems to sort of be completely swamped by a sustained component that hops in here and also here, right? So this is sort of mixed time wavelength encoding, which can get quite complicated. Then you get sort of classical opponent cells here. This is component, this is opponent in a different way. And then you get a mixture of these complex kinetics and opponency as well, right? So this is, this, this is sort of as, as crazy as they get. So very sustained in the UV, so very on transient in the red and then actually sort of below baseline in between. So quite a lot of diversity. Um, and if you compare that to these are just the mean uh, tuning functions of the cones, uh, now the cones start to look a little bit vanilla compared to all of this, all of this craziness. So what then Philip did is he decided, okay, so maybe I can generate a nice linear model, again, linear, um, that can take these guys and a bunch of time components, fast and slow on and off components, essentially, in order to explain these tuning curves in a linear connectivity model. So this is what is done here. So here are the tuning functions of the four cones. Here are the four components that he's using, on transient, off transient, as well as on sustained and off sustained. Um, and um, I will explain how this works in a moment. So if you look at this, guys, this is, this is the model in action. 
So what you see here in gray, this is the actual cluster mean of some bipolar cell cluster. And then superimposed here in black thick is the reconstruction. As you can see, the reconstruction is really pretty good and it sort of captures these subtle nuances of the transient sustained thing here and the thing where the transient goes a bit weaker, etc. The way that this guy is built is from a connectivity matrix to red, green, blue, and UV cone circuits. Um, and here are the components. So this is on, on, off, off. Uh, and whenever they're brown, that means it's a sign conserving weight. So this is a weight that would be generated by a so-called off bipolar cell. So off bipolar cells just take the off cone and copy the signal essentially, whereas the on bipolar cells would flip the signal. Um, so this is what these blue guys would, would indicate. So it kind of suggests that here you've got sort of an off connection to on, uh, uh, off connection to the on circuits and the on, on connection to the off circuits. It's very confusing, I know, but it basically gives you these tuning functions. And if you add them all up, you get this. And this is the net red cone contribution that you need in order to generate this curve. And then you get the net green cone, the blue cone and the UV cone. Uh, uh, contribution, you add all of these guys up and then you get the black line. And then what we get out of that is basically these squares, right? So we get a bit of brown and a bit of blue squares indicating that you need both sign conserving and sign inverting signals in the red. Um, for example, the blue, you only need the sign conserving uh, signals and so on. So hopefully this is, uh, I know it's a bit confusing, but hopefully this is readable. And just to make the point, it, this, is, this is not just one cluster that works, it always works really well. So here's four different clusters showing, and here's just the components. So for example, this one is quite easy to understand, I guess. You've got this, this two humps in the tuning, and the model basically says the first hump is the red cone, and the second hump is the UV cone. And if you add them up with these weights, then this is what you get. Or for example, here is opponent one. It's taking red versus UV, and then the blue sort of contributing a bit to, to jiggle the tuning about, and then you can explain it, and so on. Um, maybe just this guy, just to, to explain how this trans, how, how these these mixed time color codes can be generated. So here you've got a, a like a, a, you've got a red cone contribution with a transient component and a UV cone contribution without a transient component. And if you add them up, then you get these transients here and the lack of transients here. So this is how we we think we can explain these these these, these complex tuning curves like this. So in each case we're getting these squares. So now this is cluster one, cluster two, cluster three, cluster four, and so on. And this is red, green, blue, and UV. And now really what I would just like you to do is just to eyeball sort of the shading that you see here. And you might notice some patterns. So for example, in the first third here, you've got a lot of brown up here, and then the UV is the one that flips. And that suggests that you're basically doing the same thing with the red, green, blue cone in terms of polarity, and then the UV is adding the opposite polarity. Then here you've got one where it takes always the same polarity, but they're actually quite rare cases. This one here, this one here, this one here, there's a few the other way around, but they're actually not the most common case. Um, and then every now and then you've got the red one doing its own thing and then the, these guys doing, doing weird stuff. So there's a few patterns in here. Um, and you can sort of just, just eyeball these histograms um, to get a few, few ideas. So the first thing is that red, in terms of contribution to that is needed to explain the bipolar cells tends to dominate. Um, so you get much bigger values in general. Uh, that's particularly for the sign conserved, but also for the sign in inverted uh, values. Whereas green, blue, and UV are sort of similar in terms of the weight that you need. Um, then if you correlate your red component with whatever the green and the blue components are doing, they're very strongly correlated. So that suggests that red, green, and blue cones are wired in a sort of, they, they tend to be wired together if possible. But then if you do the same exercise with red versus UV, and by that extension also uh, green, blue versus UV, you can see there's basically no dependence. So it seems that you've got the red, green, blue circuits, they're doing something together, and then the UV is doing whatever it wants, but it's certainly not being influenced by whatever red, green, blue are doing. So, um, it kind of highlights that the UV channel or the UV connectivity is sort of the weird one, the odd one out. Um, and if we now convert all of these into just the net weighting that we've done before from the anatomy, um, it looks like this. So I'm just going to jump back and forth so you understand what's going on. So for example, the very first one here, this is red on, green on, blue on, UV off, which comes from the fact that you've got brown, 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 blue, and so on, right? Um, so this is the connectivity matrix that we infer from the function. 
And the key punchline here, other than that it's completely unreadable, is that it doesn't look anything like the anatomy. It looks completely different. So here is again, for comparison, the adult anatomy, quite clean, you don't, there's not a lot of action here. Um, whereas here, really, you have an all connect all matrix. It really strongly suggests that there's very few bipolar side channels that are not in some way drawing from all four cones together. Um, it happens every now and then, but it's quite rare. Now, um, how that's done, almost certainly amacrine cells, and we are very actively working on trying to understand this. Um, but just, um, uh, and, and this is this is sort of a, a future projection. So one way of we're trying to understand this is we are currently working on getting an EM volume together with uh, Kevin Brickman, Silke Haverkamp and at Caesar in Germany, um, where we're hoping to then trace the bipolar cell circuits um, and actually get the anatomy right in the larva and then to see if it's actually anything like the adult and if we can maybe find the green cells. Um, that aside, um, the other question, of course, is um, okay, great. So we've got these really complicated tuning functions. What on earth is the point? They're really complicated. That like, how can the brain possibly read this out, or the ganglion cells, for that matter? And um, I don't have a good answer for you, but I do have a suggestion. And one suggestion is that there may be some sort of clever stuffing of signals going on, um, where you can encode more than one thing with more with with a single bipolar cell channel. So. Um, if you, for example, look at this guy, so if you just look at the transient components, they have a certain tuning, which would be maybe like this. But then if you look at the sustained components, they have a different tuning. So what you're kind of doing with this cluster is you're encoding two different tuning functions at once, if you could only read out the fast and the slow signals separately. So to really look if that's a systematic thing, what Philip did is he basically looked at the transient components in all of these clusters and compared them to the sustained components in all of these clusters. So first of all, um, here's transient, here's sustained, and these are just the tuning functions of the bipolar cell clusters. But these are all the vanilla ones. These are the non-opponent ones, right? So except they, they sometimes touch zero, but they don't really cross zero. So we're not really interested in these for now for color processing. The ones that we're interested in is are the ones that cross zero. So here are the ones that cross zero for transient and for sustained. So what can we learn from this? So first of all, the darker the shading, the higher the number of ROIs in a cluster. So basically the light ones, then there's not so many in the dark ones, there's quite a few. Uh, and then I've highlighted here the zero crossings. And one thing that jumps out a little bit is that the transient ones are a lot more distributed compared to the sustained ones, right? So both the transient and sustained ones, they have some quite chunky zero crossings around here, um, which is basically splitting UV from not UV. And both the transient and sustained components do that. But the sustained components are really not very good at all to tell apart anything else. Like there's basically a hole here, which is nicely filled by the transient ones. So it kind of suggests that the very important distinction of UV versus not UV is carried both in transient and sustained channels. Whereas the more subtle, perhaps more interesting uh, for, for, for sort of traditional color processing uh, components is essentially just carried in the transient components. It's just not used in the sustained components. And what's neat about this is that then in theory, you could be using the sustained components to compute something else, something that isn't to do with wavelength, uh, of which there are plenty of things that the fish needs to do, of course. So this is sort of the, the theory that then emerges from this, that basically what the fish has is it has three spectral zones. It has a UV zones, like if something is below 400, it's just UV. The fish doesn't care if it's 380, 390. Um, anything that's low enough, that's UV and it's probably food. Then anything above 550, the fish also doesn't care, it's just red. And that probably means that you can use quite reliably this end of the spectrum to do all the, all the sort of traditional grayscale stuff like, like motion processing and nuanced shapes and that sort of thing. And then the middle, that's the one where it gets a bit murky and it seems that here we've got the transient components that help us generate zero crossings at all kinds of different wavelength combinations, which would in principle enable quite rich color vision in that realm. Um, something that we need to work on in the future. Now, of course, bipolar cells are not the output of the eye. Um, and you probably already guessed it. We've done the same thing for ganglion cells. We just haven't really finished the analysis. So I won't be showing you any nuance on that. I just want to show you some 
some sort of uh, examples of what you get. So here's a bunch of ganglion cells as measured in the brain. So at the level of the tactile neuropel. Um, and basically what you get is you get bipolar cells on steroids. So it kind of does the same thing as the bipolar cells, except that the tuning functions can be incredibly narrow. For example, this, this, this green here tends to be quite good at that. Um, and you get very dominant transient components, which are a bit less obvious in the bipolar cells. And also everything's rectified. You can see, you see there's very few ganglion cells that go below zero. Of course, that's expected because you've got a spike in code. So encoding a negative event in a spike is, is difficult. You basically need a sustained spike rate. And it seems that most zebra fish don't employ that strategy at the ganglion cells. So um, a lot of complexity going on at the level of the ganglion cells. Um, and uh, hopefully in the near future, we'll be able to say something cleverer than that. Now, but ultimately, um, it's not just the ganglion cells, the brain also needs to respond uh, to visual stimuli. And we just wanted to get an initial overview of what the brain does with these different wavelength stimuli. Um, but there's one little problem, and that is that the brain is a three-dimensional structure, which is quite complicated. And in fact, the, the optic tectum is quite tilted in the animal. So this is where all the ganglion cells go. So if you now take a scan plane and you scan across the head like this, Sure, you catch the tectum, but the problem is that you're um, you're sort of confounding the retinotopic layer, which is this one, with the layer layer. Um, so the tectum is a layered structure, and the, the lamination goes in this direction. So basically, over here, you've got well, at any point of your scan, you end up with a combination of position information and layer information, which is which is difficult to interpret. Um, so what Philip has designed is a nice little tool. Philip here, postdoc in the lab, is a tool that allows us to scan with these sort of half pipe, half pipe scans uh, using an electrically tunable lens. Um, so we can either follow the brain curvature in a positive way, or we can also follow it in a negative way. So try to catch the, the pretectal arborization fields here. Um, that's, that's on Biarchive if you're interested. Um, and here's sort of the result of what that does. So here is the standard scan, and you can see this is the tectum, and you can sort of, you can see the layers, and that's, even though that's, that can be convenient, it is the problem that it, it makes us the retinotopic information. Um, then here's the positive band, and you can well you can see that you can't see the layers, which is essentially what you want in this case because this is now retinotopic space approximately. Or you can do the negative band, and then you can see uh, the arborization fields um, at least to some extent here. So using using this approach, the positive band approach, what then um, Philip Bartle did um, is he mapped brain responses in a line where GCAMP is expressed in all the cell bodies. So we, this is not neuride information, this is just cell body information. And the caveat here is of course that transient components in, in, in SOMA recordings are very hard to pick out. So really we're just looking at the sustained components now. Um, but this is just a very big overview of all the cells that he caught. So this, these, these are the neurons that supply the tectoneuropile, neuropile. And then this is stuff behind and this is stuff in front um, for brain, habenula, that sort of area here, cerebellum and all that. And what we've done here is a very simple overview of just, we mapped all of the neurons that respond to a flash of light uh, in either an on fashion or an off fashion across the wavelength. And what I think is quite striking is this big picture here that emerges that you basically, you have your UV zone, which is basically an on channel, there's very little off going on. Um, then you've got your red zone, which is on and off as you would probably need for proper image forming vision as we, as we sort of traditionally imagine it. And that works really well. It works particularly well at this wavelength. And actually there's quite a sharp tuning here. Um, and then the intermediate tends to be mainly off. So there's a lot of interesting stuff going on, um, but again, uh, which we don't really quite understand in detail, but the, the big picture again emerges that we've got this three zone thing. We've got UV, red, and everything in between. Um, so again, of course, the idea is that maybe this is your pre-capture circuits. This is your traditional image forming vision circuit. And this is some sort of A, maybe a way to separate those two to make sure they're clean and B, of course, to do some color processing uh, while you add it. Um, so this is sort of the picture that emerges right now based on the data that we have. And hopefully in the coming months or years, I'll be able to give you a bit more nuance on, on the brain story and the ganglion cell story. Now, um, yes, I should be coming to the end of my talk. So um, this is the almost last slide. So I just wanted to, to jump back to the very first slide that I had and just point out, so all of the stuff I've shown you comes from the larval zebrafish. Um, but the larval zebrafish is a crazy outlier, right? It's got a tiny eye, 
It's got a huge density of pretty much any neuron. Uh, the neurons are really small, so uh, small neurons always have to cut corners on, on, on all kinds of computational considerations. So really, in order to get a representative understanding of what these high complexity retinas do, we should be looking at a representative high complexity retina, for example, the adult zebra fish. So this is, we are, we are now starting to focus more and more on adult zebra fish and trying to see what's going on there. We're also looking at quite a few of these other dots. We're sort of starting to increase uh, uh, our species diversity in the lab also to non-model species. Um, and one reason um, that this is particularly interesting uh, to me is if you look at your, your adult zebra fish cross-section, it's, yeah, sure, it's high density and you get, you get four cone types and it's all, all quite nice and there's, there's plenty of stuff left to be discovered. But then yet again, the zebra fish is just one more example animal with its own weird visual ecology and evolutionary history. So all animals are weird in some way, and that will be reflected in the way that the retina is organized. And so what we've, what we've got here is just an overview of the sort of retinal cross-section of quite a wide, wide range of vertebrates. And just, just to give you a flavor of how different they are, right? So for example, if you look at your, uh, your lampreys or your sharks, they have huge horizontal cells and really low density retinas. Then you've got your deep sea fish, which have triple banks, can have triple banks of rods, and basically everything else is squished down here for a little bit of computation, presumably. Or then you've got the, the this diametric opposite. You've got things like raptors, which have these huge retinas with uh, five types of cones, as well as rods, um, and very nuanced circuits uh, that are essentially unexplored. So really, I think if we need to understand, if, we, if, if our aim is to understand how computation can happen in the retina and how it can be related to what the animal is trying to do, I really think we do need to look at uh, a, a broad variety of species. And uh, so, so our lab is particularly looking at the zebra fish and we're now expanding. We've got some work on chicken going on. Uh, we are hopefully going to start some work on frogs um, uh, and, in, and on sharks. Um, but of course, uh, this, this has to be a community effort. So um, in, in our lab, you know, we, we can't do this alone. So I just, I just want to sort of highlight the problem very briefly here. So this is, this is from, a, from an editorial that I wrote quite recently. Uh, so I punched into PubMed the species name and the word retina and just counted the papers as a function of years. And if you punch in primate, including human, then you get this nice exponential growth. And that's a lot of primate retina papers. Um, of course, there's a little bit of function there from, uh, from some labs, but there's also a huge amount of medical stuff, uh, which is why this curve is always going to be the biggest one. But then if you look at the non-primate mammals, that's, that's these guys. So you've got your mice, which is the dotted line, and then everything that's not a mouse, but still a mammal. And that hugely dominates our discipline at the moment. Um, here, the green ones is everything that's not a mammal. Uh, and you can see there used to be a days in the 80s where sort of the mammals and the not so mammals, if you ignore the primates, uh, we're on par and then mammals shoot up and everyone else shoots down. And just to compare, yes, there is a handful of zebrafish papers, um, but in the grand scheme of things, uh, it's, it's really, um, we need to push both the zebrafish, but I think even more importantly, we need to push the all other species. Um, so if you are inspired to, to think about this a little bit more, we wrote this um, special issue on, on vision in non-middle species uh, with a lot of very nice, I think, contributions from, from uh, people in the field uh, talking about all kinds of animals. So we've got here the ground squirrels, we've got raptors, chickens, chameleons, uh, cichlids, archerfish, uh, axolotls, or salamanders in this case, uh, frogs, snakes, uh, these are reef fish, deep sea fish, sharks, and lampreys. So all of these species, uh, there's a nice review about what is currently known about vision in their eyes. Uh, and I really encourage you to look at those if you're interested. So uh, finally, um, and I apologize, I've gone a little bit long. Um, I just wanted to, again, highlight the people have done the work. So the vast majority of the stuff I've shown you comes from Takeshi and Philip. So Takeshi is a, is a postdoc and, and Philip is a PhD student. He's just submitted, so soon to be postdoc. Um, then additional stuff. So Philip Janiak here um, designed a two photon microscope with a curve bend, uh, with, the, with the plane bending. Laura did the natural imaging uh, data acquisition. Um, Cornelius here in Philip's lab uh, did the computational modeling with the horizontal cells and generally helped helped quite a lot with the horizontal with the with the cone uh, story as well. And then we've got Silke and Kevin who who are working with us on the EM of the of the larva zebra fish. And of course, I want to thank everyone else in the lab, uh, our funders, and of course, most of all, you for your attention. Thank you very much. On behalf of our audience, uh, applause, beautiful, talk. very satisfying. Uh, 
uh, data basically. So we have time for a couple of quick questions. The first one, uh, it's Max, Mil Max, uh, Max Milinjoj and Tudor Badia seem to have the same question. Uh, is the connectivity the same in the larva and the adult or does it keep changing um, as the larva matures basically? Yeah, Especially so um, so for the colon horizontal cell network, as far as we see, it is basically the same. Um, so in the problem with the adult is there's a little bit of disagreement in terms of exactly how many horizontal cell types there are. So some people have suggested there's a fourth one. Well, actually there is a fourth one, the rod one, I didn't talk about that. But then there's a, a fifth one, if that makes sense. Um, uh, we don't see that in our stack. So, um, but then neither are the adult people sure uh, or, or agreeing that it's there. Um, and then the only nuance that may or may not be different is whether or not the first horizontal cell connects with the UV cones or not. And there's some disagreement, but there are papers that suggest that also in adult, you get some UV cones uh, in the H1. Okay. So the short answer is it's the same. Next question from Jeff Diamond, technical question. Is the bipolar imaging calcium or voltage or glutamatergic? Uh, the bipolar cell imaging was calcium in this case. Calcium imaging. Um, one, uh, it's my own question, I guess. So uh, you ignored the rods, I guess you said, mentioned that it's not possible to image them in the larva. They're not mature yet. But how do you think that plays into the rest of the computation because you said like the red is kind of doing that job, the red channel of global light illumination levels, but where do you think rods fit into the picture? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. So, so first of all, because we do most of what we do under two photon, we've got big trouble with rods in general, because even if they were mature, we'd probably be saturating them. Um, so that's 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 a big drawback on the technique in, in general. Having said that, of course, there are there are suggestions that rods can escape the saturation, so maybe we could work with them. We do actually have um, uh, we've we've tried imaging rods, so we've got a line, a G-camp line for that in the lava. It doesn't work at all. As in, you can see them. It's just they don't do anything. Um, and actually, if you look exactly. under EM, you can see that the synapse is not finished. Um, so you can. If uh, in the adult, which we really want to go into, the rods are of course there, and then there will be a big question um, or, or almost a problem <laughs> if we do, if we if we continue doing this with two photon. Of course, so we have a multi electrode array as well, so we're we're looking in that direction, and then of course we could study the rods. Um, in terms of what we expect, so if you look in terms of connectivity across species, the rods tend to be connected, co-connected with long wavelength cones. And that's, that's pretty consistent across any species where that's been done with any, uh, any level of detail. Um, so my strong expectation is that for non-spectral processing, for the purpose of non-spectral processing, the rods do the red cone job, or the red cones do the rod job. Um, to what extent they can, in addition, be used for spectral processing? I mean, there's, there's lots of room to do that. Um, I just don't know how, how it would do that, um, yeah. So I guess that answered another question that was there, whether you plan on also getting high temporal resolution through physiology. So you said you're planning on starting. Yes, but then that would be all adult, right? So linking then the fast adult physiology with the slow lava physiology is also going to be an, another level of tricks. Uh, yeah, but we're trying. Sure. Uh, I guess one, one last question, perhaps. Uh, have you tried feeding non-natural spectra into the opponent receptor matrix? Does it perform poorly on artificial spectra? Oh, that's an interesting question. So um, it's from Gregor Belushik. Uh, we should try that. So one thing that we have done is we've played the principal, well, we've tried to recreate the principal components in our stimulator and present that to the retina in the hope that you maybe just activate the red or just activate the green cones. That turns out to be really tricky because getting the spectrum right in the stimulator is really tricky. So we've done that uh, and, and, and given up. Um, we haven't tried the non-natural ones um, in experiments or, well, in experiments all the time, right? Because we've got flashes of light, but um, in, in the computational sense, not really. But that, that's an interesting suggestion. We might, we might have to have a look at that. So I think we still have one time for one last question. This is from Simon, Simon Laughlin. Um, how do your efficient color channels compare to those predicted for humans in the paper trichromacy 
component color coding and optimal color information transmission in the retina by Gershon Bushraum and uh, A. Gottschlag in, in 1983. Uh, conceptually, they're similar. Um, the problem is that, of course, the human ones don't come from in vivo measurement of the cone synaptic terminal. So the, the concept is, is very much the same, I would think. So, so, so the, the use of a PCA space to, to sort of break spectral processing, uh, well, as, as Simon rightly points out, has been around for a while. And it tends to, it seems to work quite nicely in humans. Um, presumably it works nicely in mouse as well. It's just, you've only got two channels, so there's not much to talk about. Um, I think what, what is quite nice here is that it does work, even if you take four cones. Um, and that it happens already in the presynaptic terminal of the cone, kind of suggesting that the rest of the retina never sees anything else. Okay, so um, do you want to stay up? Like we have a couple of new questions as well. Sure. Uh, yeah. Okay, so have you tried observing pre-capture in larva with only functional UV cones? Ah, no, so we, we need to do that. So the, the reverse example, yeah. Um, we, we we are on it, uh, but we haven't done it. So that was uh, Yuxin Tong's question. The next is from Herbig Bayer. Uh, great talk, Tom. Some prey may be darkly pigmented, giving them contrast against the sky. Could a UV-sensitive inner retina subsystem in the strike zone also compute an inverted signal? It can, yes. Um, so if you look at... So bipolar cells is really where we know the most about this. And there are definitely off UV bipolar cells, um, actually all over the retina, but in, also in the acute zone, um, which seem to translate into a small number, but definitely there are ganglion cells also. So, so there is definitely that channel. Um, how it's wired centrally? Well, I guess I guess that's your job, Herbig. <laughs> so. Okay, so I think that's uh, all the questions that we had, and we are also three minutes over time. So we can conclude. Thank you, Tom, so much for for this beautiful talk and for joining us today. Thank you again. All right. All right. Do I jump out and then into the 